Today's episode is sponsored by Anchor. Wanted to create a podcast but didn't know where to get started? Well, look no further than with Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to edit and record your podcast right from your phone or computer. And Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more streaming platforms. In addition, you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you ever needed to make a podcast in one place. Ready to get started? Download the free Anchor app today or go to anchor.fm to get started. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Pull Up For The J Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Felton. <clears throat> this is episode 73. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Here come the questions. Josh, where have you been? It's been, it's been a month. You were gone for a whole month. So much stuff happened in that last month. I know, I know, I know. Trust me. I was, I was paying attention. I just... Needed to take a break. I had school is school is killing me right now. Uh, but y'all knew that it's college, right? Like <clears throat> college, anybody, it's college, right? Like we, we all knew this was going to happen at some point. It just so happened that it happened last month, but it's okay. I'm here now. Um, we have a lot to talk about, a ton to talk about. Uh, we're going to start with. Uh, let me think. I think I'm going to start with the NFL because the NFL uh, started off a headline a couple of days ago. Aaron Rodgers. Um, Aaron Rodgers, just for those that don't know. Well, matter of fact, before I get started, let me let me get my plug in for all of you guys. If you're new, make sure you uh, check out PFTJ Media on Instagram and Twitter. That's at PFTJ Media um, on Instagram and Twitter and TikTok. Mainly on Twitter, though. If you really want to have, like, discourse with me about football, basketball, all that stuff, Twitter's where you find me. You'll see a uh, young Giannis Antetokounmpo profile picture. That is me. Um, been a Giannis stand since last year's playoffs. So that's pretty much where I'm at with Giannis right now. So that explains the profile picture. Um, as always, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter on Instagram at Jay Felton. That's J-F-E-L-T-O-N-N. The Twitter is 3NC. I'm so rusty. I haven't done it in a month. That's crazy. Um, but this is episode 73. This is the Dennis Rodman episode. <coughs> yes, Dennis Rodman wore number 73 for, I think, like 23 games with the Los Angeles Lakers. If you didn't know he played for the Lakers, now you know. Um, he played one season, although I wouldn't even call it a full season, 23 games. He averaged two points, 11 rebounds, 1.3 assists on 34.8% shooting and 43% for the free throw line. That is typical Dennis Rodman numbers right there. That 73 looks icy on him. I'm not going to lie. If I can't think of a title, that's going to be the that's going to be the title picture for this for this episode. Um, I'm also not on Instagram and Twitter right now uh, or I'm not on Instagram right now. I'm barely on Twitter right now. Got to got to focus on school. Maybe once Thanksgiving break comes, I'll be more active on there. But uh, yeah, just it, just in case you're wondering where I've been. <clears throat> NFL, let's get back to let's get back to business here, right? Aaron Rodgers is the topic of conversation today. Um, for those that don't know, Aaron Rodgers uh, is out for the Packers' next game due to health and safety protocol. Uh, they're supposed to be playing the Chiefs on Sunday, but he will not be playing because. He has COVID. Now, what's the issue with that, you might ask? Well, you know, if you get the vaccination, you only need to get two negative tests in the next 24 hours to be off that COVID list and you can be eligible to play. If you're not vaccinated, it's going to be a week, minimum. And guess what? The fact that we've announced it already on November 4th, happy birthday to my brother, it's his 21st birthday today. 
The fact that we're now seeing it on November 4th, a Thursday, tells you that Aaron Rodgers is not vaccinated. Now, is that a huge issue? Depends on who you ask. I would like to see people get vaccinated. I would like to see these athletes get vaccinated. But again, it's their choice, right? If they choose not to play and that's on them, they just not going to get paid or whatever. And Aaron Rodgers is in that category, right? Aaron Rodgers said at training camp, quote, yes, I'm immunized. That was a whole lot of cap. Whole lot of cap. That that's actually you know that's a fire title, whole lot of cap. That might be that's gonna be the that's gonna be the um, front running uh, title for today's episode episode seventy three. Whole lot of cap, um, from Aaron Rodgers. So obviously uh, the report is that his teammates knew, right? His teammates knew um, that he was not vaccinated, but. The media didn't know, and he told the media he was. So now it kind of looks like, oh, what's going on with this, right? Now, what I've been seeing lately is, like, technically people are saying he didn't lie because, you know, immunized is not the same thing as vaccinated. We get all of that. But the bottom line is this. When we get to comparing it to someone like, say, Kyrie, who straight up was like, hey, I'm not vaccinated. I'm just not going to play, right? It makes it look like, okay, that's more, it, it, it doesn't look as problematic, right? Because I guess in the sense that Aaron Rodgers is like, okay, one, the Packers have only lost one game this year. They're first in the NFC North. They're chasing the first spot. They're chasing home field advantage in the NFC playoffs. So for you to be kind of careless like that, from what reports are saying is that it started at the uh, Halloween party or that's being under the microscope. It kind of just looks like a mess right now. And, you know, after looking at the numbers earlier in the year, it looked like, okay, the NFL is, they're not playing games right here. Like players are getting vaccinated. Teams are taking this seriously. Guys are taking this seriously. It's starting to look like that. That might not be the case necessarily. And, um, if that's the case, if we're really looking at Aaron Rodgers who can potentially miss more than a game, um, how serious could that be? Aaron Rodgers missing a game at this stage in the season is huge. Like, let's not lie here. Aaron Rod- like, is Jordan Love ready? Who knows? Jordan Love will get his first chance. And honestly, this will be helpful for him because we all know the He's basically going to be the Packers quarterback next year and into the future. Like, that's pretty much been established already. Aaron Rodgers ain't coming back. But still, like, the fact that this was able to get out and he kind of, like, all this media, this all this speculation around him kind of just disappeared or was non-existent because he just straight up lied is crazy. And you, it start to, you start to wonder at this point, how many people are really vaccinated in the NFL? If it's that easy to just say, hey, I'm, I'm vaccinated when I'm really not vaccinated. What could that lead to? Right. Kirk Cousins has been like, "Nah, I'm not vaccinated. I'm, I'm not doing none of that. Aaron Rodgers. Obviously feels the same way, but just said that he was vaccinated. And that seems like it can be very problematic for obvious, obvious reasons. That could be problematic, but I'm not really going to harp on Aaron Rodgers situation so much because this is really kind of new information. I do want to talk about, again, what's going on in the NFL. Henry Ruggs. Henry Ruggs, former wide receiver for the Las Vegas Raiders. Yes, I say former because he was recently released. Um has been arrested for DUI reckless driving. He uh he killed a mother and child over not over the weekend on Tuesday. Uh drunk driving. I believe he was going a hundred and the report says he was going 136 miles an hour. And you know the way it's looking right now 
he's facing like up to 20 years. He's facing 20 years. And if you ask me, I honestly think he's end, going to end up getting near the far end of that. Now, is the NFL doing a private investigation? We have no idea. That information hasn't come out yet. My guess is he might go on a commissioner's exempt list. Those are what people are saying. I don't know. But this is just a terrible, this is a sad, sad situation. For one, why are you going that much, that high? Like, I believe 165, 168, he was going, why are you going that fast? Why are you that drunk? Like, his blood, his blood level was twice the, twice the permitted, twice the acceptable rate. And now you've just, you've just ruined a family's life. You've just ruined your own life. Um, it just, it just baffles me how, how this could, how people could be moving like this. It, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. And frankly, the NFL has had so many, so many issues with like athletes just doing this stuff. It just, it just doesn't. I mean, I'm seeing a lot of reports like his his Corvette is destroyed. If you see the pictures online, the front is absolutely just is so sad. Um, you know, Derek Carr was showing him love, but it just it just, it's just hard to find a spot right now for like where how do you feel for this? How do you feel for this? Because you have people showing them love, but you know, with the situation he's in, he's probably, his football career is probably done. 156 miles an hour, left a 23 year old woman dead. Blood, rugs, blood alcohol level was more than twice the legal limit. He had such a bright future. He was balling this season. And he had a gun in the front seat. It's just like, come on, man. Come on now. I'm not even trying to, I really don't want to talk about this because like, this is the type of stuff that'll literally make your blood boil. Not even for, for several different reasons. Prayers out to, uh, the family of the deceased, um, prayers to Henry Ruggs family, because I don't know how, how many times they're going to see him, uh, face to face. I don't know. I don't know if their family members ever going to get out of jail for that. Because it, it, that's a very, very, very sad situation. It hurts. Um, moving on. We're going to go to the NBA. Talk about some positive things. Like I said, I just got back on Twitter. I just got back on Twitter. Um, I want to say, like, I got back on Twitter today. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I got back on I got back on uh, Twitter today. And the first thing I tweeted in like two weeks, I said the Clippers could really use Carl Anthony Towns. That's all I tweeted. That's all I tweeted. The Clippers could really use Carl Anthony Towns. And in came a flood of replies from people I, I follow, people I don't follow, um saying they don't have anything to trade. They don't. Have, I, I'm convinced at this point people just want to argue to argue. Uh, well, actually, I've been known that. What are we talking about here? But like, it's like, bro. I brought this up because Carl Anthony Towns. He's been upset. The Timberwolves have dropped three straight games. And yes, today's going to be a lot of NBA overreactions through through the first two weeks of the season. Just get over. If you don't want to hear it, I, I'm sorry. You you might want to skip this part. I'll put the timestamps below. But um, we're going to do a lot of overreactions to some of your favorite teams today. We'll probably do Timberwolves, Lakers. Obviously, we're doing Clippers right now. We'll talk Washington Wizards, Chicago Bulls, Eastern Conference, all that stuff. Go to State Warriors. Stay tuned. So. Right, the Timberwolves have dropped three consecutive games. It's been looking rough for them. They've only had really one impressive win on the season. That was against Milwaukee. Um, right now, Anthony Edwards is looking like the best player on that club. And Carl Anthony Towns is upset. Right, 
there was a like that said uh, apparently he liked on Twitter. Um, uh, apparently he liked on Twitter. What did he say? He said um, free cat. It was like a hashtag free cat thing, right? So, right, the way it's looking, he's not happy. And the way he's playing suggests this could be Anthony Edwards' team. So, I got to put two and two together at some point. We got to figure out, does Cat want to be here? And with that being said, considering the Timberwolves have made it the playoffs one time in his career, and I was with Jimmy Butler, one of the biggest ceiling raisers in the NBA right now, one of the most valuable ceiling raisers in the NBA. It's no surprise that when he leaves, they're back to an irrelevant, non -com non competitive franchise. And the reason I brought up the Clippers is because of this, right? I'm looking at the Clippers this year, and as it stands of this recording, November fourth, two thousand and twenty-one, the Clippers are three and four, which means they are tied for ninth place with Minnesota. The reason I feel better about the Clippers than I do the Wolves is one. They have Paul George on their team. And Paul George should probably be the front runner for MVP, if not top three. And they have a lot of guys out that should be coming back that you can at least look at and be like, okay, these guys are valuable pieces to their team that you know they're going to come in, contribute, get minutes, and fill a certain role that is missing. Serge Ibaka, Marcus Morris. Obviously, Kawhi Leonard, right? That that need not to be explained. The Timberwolves don't have that, right? They've got D'Lo, they've got Cat, they've got Anthony Edwards. That's about it. And they're still somewhat underperforming, right? It's, it's hard to gauge whether they're underperforming or not, but they've lost three straight. They lost to the Clippers last night. They play them again tomorrow. And Tim and Carl Anthony Towns, he said in an interview, he said, you know, in being in Minnesota, you know, a three-game losing streak can turn into 18-19 real quick. He's not wrong. They've made the playoffs, what is it, one time? It, they've only made the playoffs one time since KG left. They've only made the playoffs two times since 2004. Like, when we talk about remedial franchises, I, I hate using the word remedial to describe a franchise, but they're a remedial franchise. They've had so many front office issues. They've had so many team issues they just have tried to put together teams that never worked out remedial Carl Anthony Towns could easily up and leave and so when I tweeted out the Clippers should give him a call you know the Clippers should try and go after him I got some replies I'm read them out because uh shout out to you guys even if you disagree with me just 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 don't be cursing me dog I will block you in a heartbeat I I don't have time for this uh, somebody said they traded uh, shout out for Obli season on Twitter. Darius Garland profile pick is fire. They traded all their picks for Paul George. So what are they going to offer? The way I feel about Carl Anthony Towns right now is I feel like his trade value. Maybe this is just me, my opinion on his trade value, but I feel like his trade value is similar to what Russell Westbrook's was last year, right? The late, the wizards, I feel got the best package they possibly could have. Because I feel like if they waited another year, Russ is not even tradable. They waited until the last second. When it looked like at the beginning of the year, Russ's contract was going to be untradable. Russ picked it up near the end of the season, right? Got to the playoffs. Beal kind of got hurt. Playoffs came. Beal showed out. Russ didn't. Another first round exit, okay? And it felt like Russ's value had risen to a level that kind of justified, hey, I'm worth $41 million. I didn't make the all-star team, but I averaged a triple-double, and I got the Wizards to the playoffs. That's going to bring your value up, right? The Lakers, I'm not going to say they lost that trade, right? I On Twitter, I was overreacting. Oh, yeah, they're, the Wizards 5-1, they won the trade. It's still early. It's still early, right? Um, we'll get into the Lakers in a minute. But the bottom line is what, what the Lakers gave up for Russ was some role players, and a couple second round picks, right? Nothing crazy, but for the for the for the Wizards, it fixed their depth issues, right? They didn't have any depth, and you look at the Wizards' depth now is crazy, and they still have guys out. So my assumption is 
okay, Carl Anthony Towns isn't making $41 million. He's making $33 million. Carl Anthony Towns also hasn't been an all-star in two whole seasons. Carl Anthony Towns also hasn't really been that healthy over the last couple of years. But Carl Anthony Towns fills a valuable role. Now, Froble season made a great point. He said Carl Anthony Towns is much younger. He's only 26. Russ is like 33, 34, right? Fair point. But I do think, in theory, the trade value is still the same, right? Do the Clippers have young pieces that can give up for Carl Anthony Towns? Yes. Do Clippers fans want them to do it? <laughs> no, right? I'm already seeing in my, my reply. My mentions are getting lit up as we speak right now. Talking about they don't want to trade Terrence Mann and Luke Kennard. I feel you. Luke Kennard especially has looked really good. Terrence Mann has been looking decent. He's been looking pretty solid. But I will caution like this as a Wizards fan. Don't get attached to players, right? Front offices have this thing where they, they, they really have fans wrapped around their fingers. Like their loyalty is to them. And you grow an attachment to players when they play well, which is understandable. Terrence Mann played out of his mind. Had a, had a, he caught the Holy Ghost. I'm not even going to say he caught the Holy Ghost because that makes it seem like it was a fluke. And I, I think he can, the way he's been playing, I think he can, he's capable of doing it again. But he caught fire at the most opportune time. Had the best game of his career during the most important game in Clippers franchise history. So it makes sense why Clippers fans feel he is untradeable. But I will say, Carl Anthony Towns, Carl Anthony Towns is better than, like, let's be real. Like, Carl Anthony Towns is better than everybody on that roster except Kawhi and Paul George. I'm just saying. And when we talk about the Clippers, the Clippers are second worst rebounding team in the league. Second worst. Season's early. But, you know, you, you have Zubat. You would think Zubat would get rebounds. He doesn't really get rebounds. I'm surprised Philadelphia is so low considering they have Drummond and Embiid. But, yeah, the Sixers are bottom. The Clippers are second to last. So, that's part of the reason why, you know, when, they're, when we're talking about them losing very close games, like they're losing close games because they can get rebounds, right? Even Zubat, seven-footer. How are you averaging five rebounds? You gotta you gotta average more than five rebounds, brother. They 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 rely on you too much for you to only get five rebounds. So, what I was saying is, in theory, that's really why I think the Clippers should go after him. He also spaces the floor. Plus, I do think if Carl Anthony Towns were to be say say the the Wolves were to say, hey, I think Carl Anthony Towns is worth two first rounders. The Clippers have two first rounders in twenty seven and twenty eight. 2027 and 2028. That's a long time from now. But I mean, hey, if you're trying to win a championship, who cares about picks? You can get them back if you if you if your franchise window is closing, you trade your star players away and you get the picks back, right? As if it never happened, right? That's really what you're supposed to do. I I don't under I feel like if I were a GM, I'd kind of be like that uh what was a GM in the 80s from the Cavs that traded every, uh, uh, what is it, the something rule, uh, where you can't trade back-to-back -back first round picks. Oh, the Sapien rule, the Sapien rule. The owner from the Cavs that used to trade like every first round pick, that would be me. Obviously, obviously, right, you can't do that. Actually, I don't think you could trade back-to-back -back first round picks. But um, all I'm saying is that the Clippers do have options here. So... If you do feel like the Clippers could, in fact, get Carl Anthony Towns, do you not go try and get him? I mean, the way I see it, I've always felt the NBA is an arms race, right? The way it stands right now, I don't think there's any clear-cut favorite, right? We're going to talk about the Nets and Lakers in a minute. Those two were my clear-cut favorites to start the season. But as I said, don't hold me accountable until the trade deadline, after the trade deadline. That's when I'll give you my honest opinion because... Who knows what teams are looking like. But as it stands right now, I thought, hey, three All-Stars, you need at least three to compete now. You could, you really only need two. The way Paul George is playing, he's playing like he's playing like a certified bucket getter that he is. He's playing like the type of Paul George that the Clippers need when Kawhi gets back if they want to win a chip. 
the problem is, and I've, I've been seeing it a lot of my timeline, I'm not really sure if this is, if I'm going to say this is accurate or not, but people are saying, you know, Paul George is better number one option than number two option. Maybe it's just me, but I feel like that's every player though. Like you give any all-star like more touches, more possessions, more time to handle the ball. They're going to have better numbers. They're going to look better. Like Clay Thompson is really good. If you gave Clay Thompson like 25 shots, told him to come off screens and take 25 shots instead of 18, my guess is that he would look better. Now, I don't know for certain, but that's my guess. I think if Anthony Davis were on his own team taking his taking all the shots, he would look better than he does now. And Anthony Davis looks incredible now. He would probably look like what Giannis looks like now, maybe. Maybe less than Giannis. I don't think he's better than Giannis, but still. It just it just one of those things. Right? When you play with other players, you sacrifice. James Harden doesn't look anything like James Harden. And we'll get into that with the rule changes in a minute. But let me know on Twitter if you think uh, the Clippers should go after Carl Anthony Towns. Do you think that's a good move? Do you even think that's a good move for them to do? Do you think Paul George and Kawhi is enough to win a chip? I don't know when Kawhi is supposed to come back. I don't know when Serge Ibaka is supposed to come back. He ain't played in like five years. And obviously Morris is nursing a knee injury. Hopefully he gets back on the court soon. But now I want to talk about the NBA rule changes. NBA rule changes have been... Uh, NBA rule changes have been interesting because I've been seeing people, uh, you know, you know, we talk about like, uh, like the MJ LeBron debates and stuff like that. And people like to compare eras. Oh, right. Like the players in this era are better, blah, blah, blah. Look at the efficiency. Look at the points per game and stuff. And it's funny how one rule change, one simple rule change, no create the offensive player cannot create contact. How drastically that has changed the entire offense of the league. Like, we're talking like, I've saw tweets like, oh, uh, so-and-so is averaging 30 on uh, 19, 20% from three and 35% from the field. Iverson is going to get his flowers today. It just made me laugh because it's like, we really we really sat up here and and including me underestimated how advantageous the rules are for players today. Like players today are very creative to the point that you can you can just grab onto somebody's arm and create contact. Right? And so we're looking at guys like James Harden coming out the gate struggling. Trey Young. I wouldn't I would say Trey Young has been struggling a little bit. Dame Lillard has been struggling a little bit. I think guys that kind of have predicated their game on looking for contact to score are struggling right now because those whistles those whistles are a lot tighter. And right, we've seen guys get upset out here. James Harden doesn't even look like an all-star right now. It's just crazy to me. And you've got guys like Ozzy KD Never needed foul calls to get buckets. Paul George never needed foul calls to get buckets. John Morant looking like, looking like, uh, shoot, y'all know he looking like D Rose out here. He he's looking like the uh, like an MVP front runner right now. Never needed contact. He finished through the contract. He he finished through the contact. He said we like those. We like those. So I do think these rule changes are interesting. And it does make me wonder when oh, I used to think old heads were hating like, oh, if I were playing in today's game, I'd average so and so. I was like, OK, I think you're just saying that because you think your era was more physical, more competitive. But like, nah, like legit seeing the way people are responding, they're not really wrong about their era being more physical and how rules are really just like rules have made it one rules have made it almost impossible to play defense. And made it way easier to play offense. And when you look at guys that were scorers back in their day, obviously they're going to feel like they're capable of doing what a lot of players are doing now. And James Harden is showing that to people. James Harden, you know, he's been struggling. He's been struggling mightily. Another reason could be what I've heard Paul George said in, in, uh, in a post-game interview. 
that, hey, the change from Spalding to Wilson this summer is affecting a lot of guys' jumpers. That was my first thought coming into the year. I, that was actually one of the last tweets I tweeted before I went on this long sabbatical. I said, I wonder if the Wilson ball is affecting these players' rhythms and their jumpers and their efficiency. Because if you've been used to dribbling a Spalding ball, shooting a Spalding ball in the offseason for the past, p- players have for the past 25 years, and then boom, we're going to switch to Wilson. Now, I played with a Wilson ball in high school. And I always prefer Spalding because I felt Spalding had a better grip, right? I felt Wilson balls, they were, Wilson balls felt heavier and they felt harder to grip and have control of than a Spalding ball. And I think a lot of players feel that way as well. Maybe they're just having a hard time adjusting to it. It's early, but all I'm saying is old heads are, old heads are having a time in their life right now watching guys struggle to put up numbers comparable to, you know, the 2000s era players, 90s era players. It's interesting. It's interesting. I want to talk about the Nets because we're talking about rule changes. We're talking about James Harden. Um, the Nets have been struggling. We're going to put this into a Nets-Lakers segment. I'm not really trying to talk 30 minutes on Nets and Lakers here. Um, we'll start with the Nets because why not? Kevin Durant has been balling out of his mind. But we knew that. It's Kevin Durant. Like, to me, he's the third best player in basketball. Some people have him as the best player in basketball. Some people have him as number two. He's top five for show. He's top five, definitely. And even though it feels like the Nets are struggling, they're still tied for fifth in the Eastern Conference. They've won three straight. It's just like, one, Kyrie's not out there. And their defense actually looks good. Their defense looks good, and their offense is terrible. It's not terrible. It's mid. We'll say it's mid. It's it's average. It's mediocre. It's not what we expected, right? We're talking a team that had statistically the greatest offense ever last year. I'm not trying to be a stat head, but when you also combine that with the talent they have, you can make an argument last year's team was the most talented offensive roster we've ever seen. Right? You can make that argument. But nonetheless, without Kyrie, I didn't expect the Nets to struggle this much offensively. But looking at it, they probably need Kyrie back if they want to win a chip. I'm just saying. They probably going to need Kyrie back if they want to win a chip. Kevin Durant's been balling. James Harden's been struggling. Not only struggling to score, struggling to... You know, control pace, control tempo, get past guys. It looks like he's lost a step. I'm not trying to be that one guy in media that overreacts. Oh my gosh, are the Nets done? Oh, are they? Is this a legacy defining game in week three of the NBA? No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. But what I see from the Nets is they look like a team that. They need their best at this point. Their best offense is their defense. And you look at this team when they play teams that are way more physical, they have trouble. Like the Bucks game, Giannis made them boys look little. The Hornets game, Ish Smith, Ish Smith was giving them work. The Heat game, the Heat are just too great defensively for you to do anything with. So it's like. While they're losing the good teams, it's really hard to gauge the Nets right now because they're they're not what we expected. And conversely, we say the same thing about the Lakers. I expected the Lakers to be an amazing defensive team. I thought they had some questions defensively, giving up some people. But I still felt with Anthony Davis there, no way they're not a top three defensive team. Boy, was I wrong. Not only is this team bad defensively, But the lineups they be running, I'm just looking around like, ew. Now, one thing I'll say about Nets and Lakers that I didn't expect is, I don't think anyone expected the Lakers at this point to have a better offense than the Nets, and the Nets to have a better defense than the Lakers. Like, that just doesn't, if you would have told me that a month ago, I would have been like, ha, 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 you're funny, get on my face. Like, it just seems asinine to think. But lo and behold, this is the truth. The Lakers defensively have been terrible. Part of that is because they want to play DeAndre Jordan 
and Anthony Davis in the front court. DeAndre Jordan can't guard a grandma, can't guard a parked car. He can't. He, he's slow, right? He, he can't move that quickly. So teams are abusing him, all that stuff. Also, the stars. Anthony Davis hasn't really been locked in all the way defensively. Obviously, when fourth quarter comes, they turn it up. And that's a luxury they have. When you're a great team, you can just turn it up. But when you're playing good teams and not remedial teams like the Houston Rockets, turning it up in the fourth quarter is not going to get you victories, right? I was watching, I watched both Lakers games when they played the Rockets. The Rockets lead the league in turnovers coming into the game. So I'm not really, I'm not really, what I saw from the Lakers is not, oh, they suffocated defensively. It's kind of just like that's who the Rockets are. That's it's just as much who the Rockets are. And watching the Rockets lead through three quarters, Lakers say, all right, we're done playing around. LeBron takes over. They win, right? So he did the same thing against Cleveland. LeBron, all right, let me stop messing with these fools. Let me actually try for real. And they beat Cleveland, right? They beat, they beat the Rockets. They beat Cleveland. They beat the Spurs. They turn it on, beat the Spurs. They turn it on, beat the Grizzlies, right? Those are teams that you can turn it on and get away with winning games. But when you play teams like Miami, you play teams like Charlotte, depending on what Char what version of Charlotte you get. You play teams like Milwaukee when fully healthy, Chicago. You play teams like the Clippers, the Knicks. Those aren't going to be teams that you can just turn it on and expect to win like that. You gotta you gotta bring that energy from the jump, and that's the really concerning thing about the Lakers, is that their effort defensively isn't there. Offensively. It feels like they're finally getting in the rhythm of things, right? When they started the year, it was like, why is Russ taking so many perimeter shots? He's turning the ball over this many times, right? Teams are daring him to shoot. It feels like the Lakers have figured out, in a way, what to do offensively. They just got to figure out the effort defensively. They've got to figure that out. And you got to—you can only figure that out playing. You got to play. And this team is not healthy. LeBron's going to be out another week with an injury. Um, it's starting to feel like I'm not going to be a, a, a Cliff Kellerman. But Tom, it feels like it feels like LeBron is getting up there. Father time is catching up because, and it's okay to say that. I mean, it's not like I still have him as a second best player in basketball. With that being said, like father time is here, but he's still the second best player in basketball. Second or third, whoever you have, I don't care. But he's had major injuries the past two of the past three seasons. And then the one season we're talking about, right, the most unique season in NBA history that will never be replicated. I'm not sure how much weight you want to take adjusting a player through that season, right? Not saying the bubble doesn't count. The bubble does count. But I did not re-rank my top players rankings after the bubble. The bubble was not going to change anything to me. You, I don't care if you average 50 in the bubble. It wasn't going to change my list. So, you know, with LeBron, I don't know if they're low managing him. But the blessing is, you know, you get Russell Westbrook for these reasons. LeBron don't got to play against the OKC Thunder on a Thursday night. He doesn't have to play Josh Giddy and Darius Baisley in the Thunder on a Thursday night. He can rest. And the Lakers should win this game. I'm saying this before the game plays because they should win this game. And if they don't win this game, then the Lakers, they got they got a lot more to figure out. Let's say that. They have a lot more to figure out. Because some teams have completely different rosters. They're just throwing guys together. And they've made it work. Like the Miami Heat. Let's talk about the Miami Heat. Because they're a team, right? The Miami Heat are a team that... You know, they, they added a bunch of pieces late in the year, and all of a sudden, they're 6-1. and one. They're the best defensive team in the league. Bam is the front runner for Depoy. Kyle Lowry's been playing great defense. Jimmy Butler is Jimmy Butler. Tyler Hero is a front runner for sixth man of the year. And it just feels like this team, they just different. Like, they want it back in blood. Like, I knowing Pat Riley, and I'm not saying I know Pat Riley, but we know how Pat Riley thinks. Pat Riley definitely has that Laker matchup circled on November 10th. You best believe Jimmy Butler, 
all the Heat players on the bubble have that game circled on their calendar. That game is circled. And you look at who you look at who the Heat are beating. I mean, stomp the Mavericks out, stomp the Grizzlies out, stomp the Hornets out, stomp the Nets out, stomp the Miami Heat, or stomp the Milwaukee Bucks out. I mean, this team, they are not only are they beating some of the best of the best, they are blowing them out the water. They are destroying them. They are curb stomping. They are spitting on their grave. And they're not leaving any crumbs behind. They, they are, as I throw out every metaphor analogy you can think of to describe this team, this team is not playing any games. And knowing how they feel about the bubble, they feel like, hey, if we were healthy, we would have won, right? They definitely are going to try and get it back in blood like Pooh on on next Wednesday. And if the Lakers come in there lethargic, if the Lakers come in there with no defensive intensity, thinking, oh, we can just turn it on in the fourth quarter, that's not going to work against Miami. Trust me. Trust me. Especially when they have the defenders to put on people. Not not saying they can lock them up, but they'll make it tough. Like, if anyone's going to make it tough on Braun and AD, Bam can do it, and Jimmy can do it, right? So, turning it, the, the, this idea that a team can just turn it on, that's only against remedial franchises that's only against curb stomp right below average bottom freezing franchises Miami Heat's not one of them Miami Heat they're playing the best basketball in the league right now better than Chicago better than New York better than Utah better than the Wizards better than 76 is better than Toronto better than all of these teams better than Golden State they are playing they're playing like a team on a mission. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that they're front runners because I still feel like Milwaukee and Brooklyn can get it together. I think Milwaukee, I'm not going to react to Milwaukee right now because Middleton and Drew aren't playing like they're they're injured and Giannis is putting up Giannis numbers still. When you're missing two of your big 3, obviously they're not going to look like that. DiVincenzo comes back this year. I think they'll be fine. But if you're talking about Miami, Miami, when Oladipo comes back, oh, y'all forgot they had Victor Oladipo. It's about to be scary hours in South Beach. It's going to be scary hours in South Beach. Real talk. Real talk. I'm excited to see what Miami does this year. I think Miami could give anybody some problems. I feel like Miami, the Miami Heat could beat any team in the league. Any team in the league. Any team in the league. They just got to get consistent offense out of it. Because we know what they can bring defensively. Um, two more teams to wrap up this round table. Uh, three more teams. Golden State Warriors are next. Golden State Warriors. I'm not going to talk about them for too long. But I will say this. I like what I've seen from them. Steph Curry has been playing great. He didn't play great against Charlotte. But it didn't matter because they have depth. Um, if Clay, Like I said, if Clay comes back. I don't even think Clay has to be an all-star. Clay just has to come back and make threes. Like, if he could come back and still be a 40% three-point shooter and play defense like in, and can still guard, he's good. This team is going to be scary. Because, like I said, Clay Thompson brings something that I think only... I can think only three other people in the league right now currently bring in terms of defensive like it bring offensively and that is the fact that he opens up offense without move without even touching the ball and I'm not talking the same way someone like LeBron does it right to the point where they double team you coming off of a screen that le like the number of times I've seen Steph and Clay get Kavon Looney hockey assists because all they do is run off a screen Two people go at Steph. Two people go at Clay. Kavon Looney gets an easy dunk. I've seen that way too many times. I've seen that countless times over the past six years. Countless times. And just to think, the idea of having two of those guys, Steph and Clay, on the floor, James Wiseman come back, who can at least finish around the rim better than Looney. I feel like this team 
can be very, very scary. And the fact that they're really good defensively already, problems. I'm telling y'all, problems. Mark, mark my words, problems. Last but not least, we're going to talk about the Wizards and Knicks. We're going to combine that into one segment. Um, Wizards, Knicks, and Bulls. We're going to talk about the Knicks and Bulls. Y'all thought I forgot. Let's start with the Bulls. Um, DeMar DeRozan has been averaging 30-plus the last four games. He's been balling out of his mind. And the Bulls are 6-2. and two. The Bulls have had impressive comfort behind victories, specifically one against uh, Boston. Came back down, I think, 21. Then they played the 76ers, almost came back again, down 20. They've been balling out of their mind. You know, with no Patrick Williams, it clearly hasn't been a problem for them. And this is a tough schedule that they're going through right now. Like, this is a pretty difficult schedule, and they're making it look pretty impressive. They play Philly again on Saturday, then they play Brooklyn, they play the Mavs, they play the Warriors, Clippers, Lakers, Blazers, Nuggets, Knicks. Right? That's a that's a tough schedule. That's super tough. And most of these games are on the road here. Most of these games are on the road. So if they can pull out of this, like even at 500, I'll be very impressed with what I've seen from them. Uh, the New York Knicks, on the other hand. The New York Knicks have been playing also very good basketball. Uh, my thing with the Knicks is they kind of seem, I'm not going to say they play down in their competition, but they seem pretty inconsistent right now. Like, a lot of games I think they should be winning easily. It's like, eh, they're not. Like, Raptors. Raptors are actually a good team. They're better than I thought. I feel like they should have won that. Pacers, obviously, they should have won that game. Orlando, they should have won that game, too. And I think the biggest thing about New York is, because one, their defense is insane. But what happens in crunch time when you need a bucket? Because what I've seen from them lately is they've blown a couple of leads late. And I think part of it is because late in the clutch, they go to Julius Randle in the low post. That's not really an effective shot. It's not. And it, it hasn't really shown to work. But when they played the Pelicans the other night and RJ had it going, they were running clutch plays for RJ and he was cashing threes. He was knocking them down. And so I think... If they can finally, if they can open up that part of their offense where RJ becomes more assertive and they feel comfortable giving it to them in the clutch, I'll feel a lot more confident about this team in the future. Right now, I feel great on I feel really high on this team. They're tied for fifth in the, they're tied for fifth in the East. Madison Square Garden is popping. They've got the bing bong chant. I saw that video, uh, the, the Twitter video, of like the, what is it, like the side, not side talk, side talk New York. And after opening night, smoking on the Boston pack and all that. New Knicks fans are something else, man. You got to love Knicks fans. Even if you're not a fan, you got to love them. Last but not least, Washington Wizards. My Washington Wizards. They started the season 5-1, and one, which was one of the best starts in basketball. They've lost the last two. But what I will say about this team is Tommy Shepard is probably the front runner for GM of the year. Wes Huntel Jr. has been playing. Uh, he's been a phenomenal coach to start. However, one thing I'll say about this team is they have a lot of depth, but their shooting has been very inconsistent to start the year. Like defensively, they're really good defensively, which as a Wizards fan, it's hard to believe. Like that doesn't even feel weird. That doesn't feel right to me. Like what? We have a good defensive team? Since when? It's almost never happened. But now it's like, okay, guys are struggling to hit shots. I'm talking good shots. Beal has been rough from the three-point line for for a couple years now like this isn't even a new thing he's been struggling for a couple years from three but they're winning some very very close games without him and that's a testament to the depth that they have and hey i heard some report let's just say i'm not no insider or anything but i've heard some reports about tatum in dc bill's been bill's been doing some recruiting tatum's been doing some recruiting too we both know they're from st louis if you haven't seen uh enough media tweets about them being both from St. Louis. But, hey, I don't know how Tatum goes to D.C. I don't even know if that's even possible with that contract. But all I'm going to say is Tatum and Beal in D.C. would be a very, very good combination. And if you look at, when we go back to the depth that D.C. Ha that the Wizards have, 
That's without even including Rui Hachimura. Rui Hachimura, you know, he's been away from the team after the uh, the Olympics. You know, Japan didn't make it past the qualifiers. However, uh, the team reported seeing him the last couple of days. He's in good spirits and all that stuff. And it's not like he was just hiding from the team, right? It wasn't like the team didn't know where he was. He was in constant communication. He was just away from the team. From what I'm hearing is he just, uh, it was like uh, mental health, right? Obviously, international players in the Olympics is no joke. Like, they expect you to play. They expect you to do well. And if you don't, it feels like you're a disgrace to them in a lot of countries. Um, right? We're talking about Nikola Jokic is getting slandered by his home country because he didn't play in the Olympics after a long playoff run and a long season. So, you and Lucas treated like a god for taking, you know, Slovenia to the Olympics to pass the qualifiers. So, that just goes to show, like, mental health is no joke. Now, on the, on the mean, on, on the... When we talk about mental health, though, we're t when we talk about Ben Simmons, his mental health, I'm not going to call him a phony. I'm not going to call Ben Simmons a phony for uh, how he feels with his mental health and all that. But I will say this. it's been He's, been, he's made it clear he doesn't want to be in Philly. But at least by showing up to the practice facility, working out, and then claiming mental, uh, you know, saying you have mental health issues and you're consulting a private doctor is a great way to go about getting paid while still not playing, right? You say, I'm not going to go to your doctors. I have my own doctors, right? It's kind of the old Kawhi Leonard approach to not playing. Granted, Kawhi was actually hurt, but it's still an approach that was effective and it led to him getting traded. Ben Simmons has four years on his deal though. And us knowing, you know, more, uh, Maury, Daryl Maury, he said, I'll wait four years. He ain't going nowhere. He gonna stay here. But at least he's gonna get that paycheck in this case. And I'm not gonna, again, I'm not saying he's lying. Mental health is no joke. And knowing how Philadelphia treated him, I understand why he would feel a mental health break is necessary because the way it stands right now is Philly is six and two without him, so they're they're playing pretty fine without him. So we'll see what happens from there because it's a very interesting situation. Last but not least, I want to wrap up with this uh, Scotty Pippen Michael Jordan thing. Um, listen, listen, Scotty Pippen is a top fifty player of all time. And for those that don't know, he, he came out and was like, oh, Michael Jordan is selfish. The documentary was all from his point of view. I don't know what people expected from a Michael Jordan documentary. This wasn't a Bulls documentary. It was going to be from Mike's perspective and his perspective alone. I'm not quite sure what people are expecting. But regardless, he called him selfish, all that stuff, right? Bad, bad teammate. They weren't great teammates. And he, he, found, he found offense with The Last Dance. My thing with this is Scottie Pippen has been on record praising Mike and then like the next week slandering Mike. So if if in fact you feel like Scottie Pippen is right here, you have to ask yourself this question. Is, is Scottie saying this in spite of Michael Jordan and what he's done? Or is he saying this because he feels like he didn't get enough credit because from what I'm seeing, people are saying, you know, this last thing, this is a propaganda piece, which is like obvious. It's a Michael Jordan documentary. Scottie Pippen called Mike gets to care about it. Cause he released it after the three, one comeback by LeBron. Everyone knows Mike as a competitor is going to do. That's the most Mike thing ever. Right. Let me put out a doc. Maybe he is insecure. I wouldn't put I wouldn't put it past him. Like if you if you feel like hey my my legacy as the greatest player ever is being threatened, let me remind these people who I am. Let me remind these youngins who came before Mr. LeBron. And that's why he did the doc. Then okay, that's why he did the doc. Scotty has a right to feel that way. But what we're not gonna act like is if we wanna say if we wanna say Mike is selfish, right? We got to look at 
the totality of their careers, right? He said Mike was selfish for retiring before the season in 94. Okay. Call, sure, call him selfish for that. I, I don't see what how that makes him selfish. But, um, okay. Sure, let's call him selfish. Are we going to talk about everything that happened, right? The report is Scotty took that five-year 18, uh, 18 mil against the wishes of the GM. Are we going to talk about that? Are we going to talk about how, you know, the back surgery in 98 and all that stuff? Like, I feel like it sucks to me hearing all of the, the this, this, this backlash between these two great players. Because obviously we know they needed each other, right? Michael Jordan wouldn't be who he was without Scotty. Scotty wouldn't be who he was without Michael. Any all-time great player wouldn't be who they were without all-time great teammates. Just obvious. So to see them beef this, beef over this, it just feels like something that's like not necessary. Like who really needed to, who really needed to hear this? First of all, the Last Dance came out almost eighteen months ago. Like why are we, why do we even care about the Last Dance still? But even then, I I want people to understand when we when we talk about media pieces, and I do feel like I would have liked to have seen the Last Dance talk more about the Bulls and Mike himself. But to say, oh, this is a, like, to act like you didn't expect this from a Michael Jordan documentary is hilarious. Like, we're going to look back in maybe 15, 20 years. LeBron's going to release a documentary on the 3-1 comeback or uninterrupted or whatever. And you know what? No one's going to mention Iman Shumper's four-point play in Game 7. No one's going to mention the back-to-back threes J.R. Smith hit in the third quarter of Game 7. No one, they might not even mention the Draymond nut tap. No, they, no one's going to mention that stuff because in the grand scheme of things, the most important part was this guy averaged, led every team, led both teams in every statistical category. He made the block. Kyrie, his teammate, made the shot. LeBron James fulfilled a promise to Cleveland. That's going to be what the narrative is in 20 years when Giannis is... is trying to chase chase that goat status that's what it's going to be we're going to look back we're going to nitpick like oh why didn't they mention uh steph curry with a grade two mtl sprain no one what no one's going to mention that stuff it's not important in the grand story it's not important in the big story and i feel like when we look at that documentary i feel like scotty was mentioned quite a decent amount as being an important part of that role but to me the central idea the biggest takeaway was that Mike was the most important role. Mike was the most important piece to that doc, to that team, which he was, right? That's what he was. And if if you're, and that's me speaking from the casual point of view. Like we're talking about MJ praise here, like an MJ, an MJ documentary praising MJ. Think about that for a minute. Like just honestly think about that. So, you know, with me hearing the Scotty reports, it's like okay, like. Scotty's felt Scotty goes back and forth with Mike all the time based on how he feels in the morning like that That's just how it is at this point So, you know with me. It's like I see where Scotty's coming from but How how serious do I think his feelings are towards this statement? I don't think they're that strong And with that I'm gonna wrap up this episode um, There was a whole lot of cap in this episode today. That's we're gonna title this Aaron Rodgers is gonna be on the cover uh, as always, make sure you follow me on Instagram at jfelton, that's J-F-E-L-T-O, and then the Twitter is 3Ns. Follow me on PFTJ Media, Instagram, and Twitter. I'm back on Twitter. I'm not on Instagram right now, at PFTJ Media. Make sure you go share this episode with your friends. Do not text and drive, and I will see you guys next week.